Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am your host, Nico Perino. On May 6th, the Department of Education published long-awaited regulations on how colleges must implement Title IX on their campuses. Title IX is that 1972 law that prohibits sex discrimination in federally funded educational programs. Who could argue with that, right? However, over the years, and often with the federal government's prodding, Title IX has been twisted and used to justify censorship and the denial of core due process rights for students accused of sexual misconduct on campus. On the speech side, the abuse of Title IX has led to absurdities, such as charging one student in Oregon for shouting a four-word joke out a dorm window, to also a prolonged investigation in Alaska of a student newspaper reporting on a popular campus social media page. On the due process side, students accused of sexual misconduct have been routinely denied access to evidence or even to know what they're accused of doing. They've been forced to participate in hearings without adequate time to prepare, hearings where they or an advisor cannot ask questions of witnesses or accusers, hearings where the college's judge and jury are clearly biased, and in some cases, students have been denied hearings altogether. The new Department of Education regulations change much of this by requiring colleges starting on August 14th to provide students with many of the procedural safeguards that were previously denied to them. What's more, the department also will require colleges to use the Supreme Court's definition of peer-on-peer sexual harassment when adjudicating those claims. Previously, colleges often used a definition proffered by the federal government that broadly and unconstitutionally prohibited any verbal conduct of a sexual nature. Now, joining us today to break it all down is my boss, Robert Shibley. He is the executive director of FIRE and the author of the book, Twisting Title IX. We also have with us Samantha Harris, who is a senior fellow at FIRE and an attorney in the Title IX and campus discipline practice at the law firm Mudrick & Zucker. Robert and Sam, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you for having us. All right, Robert, I wanna start with you because you've read the book about Title IX. When did this really start to become an issue for fire? When did this become hot? Uh, This became hot starting um, on April 4th, uh, 2011. And there's a certain date for that because uh, that was the day the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, uh, which administers the civil rights statutes like Title IX, Um, and other laws that have to do with racial or disability discrimination, issued uh, a letter called the Dear Colleague Letter, because it starts Dear Colleague, um, where it uh, issued some uh, what we determined at FIRE to be unlawful mandates to colleges and universities about how they had to um, treat uh, people who were involved in Title IX uh, adjudications on college campuses. What a lot of people don't realize is that uh, when there is sexual misconduct on college campus, um, even if it's very serious, uh, like sexual assault or rape, uh, it has to be handled. um, You can't just turn it over to the police. The universities uh, have to conduct uh, their own investigation of it. And Title IX governs how they do that, uh, treating it as a a very severe form of uh, sexual harassment, uh, which itself is considered to be a form of sex discrimination. Um, And so on April 4th, 2011, they told schools that they had to, uh, for one thing, lower uh, the standard of evidence uh, that they used in order to adjudicate these cases. If they had one that was higher uh, than the preponderance of the evidence standard, uh, which is a 50.01% level of certainty, uh, that is, if you you know, if, if it's, you know, basically on a knife's edge, whether you believe uh, whichever side you believe, um, you know, you just, even if it's just a tiny bit more certain uh, that one side uh, is telling the truth and the other, then you need to find for that side. Um, the, uh, another issue that it did was uh, determine that um, 
colleges had to let both sides appeal um, every uh, procedure, uh, which was new at many colleges. Uh, generally speaking, you can only appeal, uh, for instance, in a criminal trial uh, if uh, you are convicted. Um, if you are found not guilty, it's over for you. The government can't appeal that and say, hey, I, wanna, I want a second try at a higher level. Uh, but colleges were told that they had to do that too. There were other um, problems in there, maybe uh, among the foremost ones was uh, continuing to promulgate bad definitions of sexual harassment that uh, were and continue to be harmful for free speech on campus. But they also said or strongly discouraged uh, colleges from allowing students to cross-examine each other, even through an advisor or an attorney. Is that correct, Sam? Um. They discouraged cross-examination um, out of concern that it would be potentially traumatic for the parties to cross-examine one another. The problem is that because virtually all universities prohibit advisors from actively participating in the process, that amounted for all intents and purposes to a ban on cross-examination because you have OCR saying, we strongly discourage schools from allowing parties to cross-examine one another, and you have schools all of which have policies prohibiting advisors from participating in the process and instead requiring students to represent themselves. Um, and, you know, that sort of was the perfect storm where most schools ended up just banning cross-examination and honestly dispensing with hearings altogether. Um, now, just to clarify, um, under federal law, under the Violence Against Women Act, um, schools are required to allow students in sexual misconduct proceedings to have an advisor. But VAWA is silent about the degree to which schools have to allow those advisors to participate. And so what most schools do is require those advisors to be what, what we call potted plants, um, to just sort of sit there um, and advise behind the scenes, but not actually participate or speak in any part of the proceeding. What was the landscape like before 2011? If you got charged with sexual misconduct on a college campus, could you expect your due process rights or could you expect any due process rights when you were going through that de campus disciplinary process? Robert, do you want to speak to that or Sam? Yeah, it, it varied. Uh, it varied more widely before 2011. I, I wouldn't say that uh, the uh, the decade before that, uh, which was basically the limit of Fire's experience, there was any kind of heyday of due process. But uh, you definitely saw uh, more diversity in terms of uh, what schools uh, would provide. Um, you know, for instance, uh, with regard to the standard of evidence, uh, many schools uh, used clear and convincing evidence, which is a, a, a more certain, you know, higher certainty standard, maybe a 70 or 80 percent certainty standard. A few even used uh, the one we're all familiar with from TV shows and uh, any of your unfortunate felonious uh, adventures you might have been on, the beyond a reasonable doubt uh, standard. That was all, you know, those were sort of plowed over uh, by the April 4th, 2011 uh, Dear Colleague letter. And because it didn't go through uh, notice and comment as required by the Administrative Procedure Act, which maybe you're going to get into, that actually just uh, came out sort of nowhere. Um, you know, the government was able to uh, consult with whoever it liked, uh, exclude whoever it liked. And, you know, pow, out of nowhere, schools all of a sudden get this uh, mandate that really is a mandate, but that the government can claim is not a mandate. And so there was really um, very little to recommend the April 4th, 2011 uh, letter um, from the perspective of legitimacy um, or, you know, any kind of, of procedural, um, you know, respect for procedure. I wanted to just add something on there, which is that, you know, and I think the best sort of measuring stick we have for what happened after 2011 with respect to due process in these proceedings is that, look, I mean, FIRE was founded in 1999. Due process has always been part of FIRE's mission. And we've always heard from students, you know, from time to time who complained that they were denied due process in campus judicial proceedings across the board. But beginning after 2011, after that Dear Colleague letter, we began to be inundated with uh, complaints from students alleging that they were denied a fair process. And we started to see um, an increase. I mean, more than 600 students since 2011 had filed lawsuits in federal and state courts um, alleging that they were denied due process in campus sexual misconduct proceedings. So while we don't have um, 
as Robert said, a super clear picture of what of how those cases were adjudicated before. Um, you know, the absolute groundswell that we got of complaints, um, which now is just you know, for those of us who work in the due process stuff at Fire, it's just a regular part of our day to get. Um, you know, submissions from students who've been denied due process in these proceedings. I mean, I think that tells us a lot about how things changed. Yeah, the requ- the requirements were unlawful from the Administrative Procedure Act um, uh, aspect, but really, it was I-, I think more than anything else a signal a signal from the federal government that um, more aggressive uh, enforcement. Uh, what I ended up sort of calling twisted enforcement uh, was going to be uh, expected from now on. And, and what was Sam was indicating uh, was is really the best uh, indicator of that in that, you know, those cases started coming our way very, very quickly uh, afterwards and really haven't slowed down since. We, we've made reference to the Administrative Procedure Act a couple times now. So I want to clarify that for our listeners. That is, that's what happens when an agency such as the Department of Education wants to promulgate a new regulation that'll be binding on those they are uh, tasked with regulating. So in this case, uh, because the Department of Education is, is tasked with enforcing Title IX on college campuses, they promulgated this rule that came out on May 6th telling colleges and universities how they need to enforce Title IX on their college campuses. But what you're saying, Robert and Sam, is that in 2011, the Department of Education didn't do that, but nonetheless sort of placed requirements on colleges and universities to abide by certain procedures when adjudicating claims of sexual misconduct on their campuses. Isn't that correct? And I think this is the first time, this May 6th, rule is the first time the Department of Education has ever promulgated a rule on Title IX going through the formal process. Well, it, it's, it's yes, you're mostly right. It's it's very confusing. Go through, didn't the 97 and 2001 guidance go through some sort of notice and comment? Yeah, here, here's the problem. So there was, there was uh, documents that were labeled as, quote, guidance um, that went through um, notice and comment process in uh, 1997 and 2001, but they didn't actually go through the formal rulemaking procedure. I don't really know uh, why that was. Uh, I wasn't uh, working at FIRE at that time. Um, and indeed, the 2001 guidance uh, actually came out the very last day of the Bill Clinton presidency. Um, so it was... it. it in terms of formal actual regulations where you can look it up, it's in the Federal Register like you would expect, you know, any kind of normal regulated entity to have to deal with. Uh, as far as I know, this is the first time since the enabling regulations for Title IX, you know, back in the 1970s that this has happened. And it might be a little bit confusing for some of our listeners who think that all of our laws are made by Congress. But as Robert is referencing, there are enabling laws, in this case, the, uh, the, the original Title IX from 1972, but then the, uh, the administration or the agencies are tasked with actually implementing that laws and ad- those laws and adding color to them. And often the way they do that is through this formal rulemaking process, which requires notice to the community affected uh, and who, who can then submit comment that the agency is then required to respond to. And if you read the May 6th regulations from the Department of Education, they're 2,000 pages long, in in part because most of those pages are spent responding to the comments that they received after they gave notice of the regulations. Yeah, I'd say that's the majority. I think that's, for me, one of the most striking things about the regulations is you know, the degree to which they not only obviously went through this formal notice and comment process, but the degree to which they painstakingly incorporate so much feedback from commenters. I mean, it just goes to show you what a huge difference it is when something is just promulgated with no input and when something actually takes public uh, input into consideration. And, you know, one of the ways we see that playing out is that in September of 2018, uh, or sorry, November of 2018, um, the department issued what's called a notice of proposed rulemaking, which is where it um, posted the proposed regulations and then opened them up for notice and comment. Um, and so, you know, until yesterday, all we had seen was were these proposed rules. And yesterday we got to see how the final rules differed from the proposed rules. Um, And while there were a lot of things that remained the same, to the extent there were changes, those changes were made uh, in direct response to the feedback received 
during the notice and comment process. So it really sort of underscores the importance of that process and why, uh, you know, something like the Dear Colleague letter that didn't go through that kind of process really was um, so problematic. We'll need, we'll need to clarify something else for our listeners. Robert, earlier when you were kind of describing the origins of the Dear Colleague letter, you said that colleges are required to adjudicate these. But we're often talking about cases of alleged rape or sexual assault. Why are colleges uh, required to adjudicate those cases? And not why aren't they not handed off to the police, which you might think would be better positioned to uh, address these concerns? Or these well, yeah, I think it's fair to say that the police are better uh, <laughs> positioned to uh, deal with allegations of, of rape and sexual assault. The, the reason that um, they have to be right now um, uh, adjudicated um, on campus is because of the way that Title IX um, has developed over the years, mostly uh, through judge-made law. Um, Title IX originally... Um, was passed back in 1972 I, when I when I wrote my short book on it, Twisting Title IX. I, I read uh, you know the comments in the congressional record, and uh, most of the discussion was actually about uh, allowing women uh, to be admitted uh, onto college campuses equally with men. Um, you know, back then, you know, a lot of places, including Harvard, for instance, uh, Harvard was only for men. They had they had Radcliffe for women, etc. Um, there were many, many. Uh, non co ed schools uh, for that. Title IX has basically eliminated, I think it's eliminated every single male co ed school except for one or two um, and, and most of the, the female ones. Um, it also very quickly uh, became a big deal when it comes to college athletics. Um, and that is, you know, throughout the 90s and, and, and much of the 2000s. Um, much of the uh, talk about Title IX had to do uh, with arguments over whether there needed to be the same number of female and male athletes on a campus and, and how you determined uh, what was equal. Um, but what happened was um, Title IX uh, actually says sex discrimination is the words it uses. Um, this was a few years later expanded to cover uh, sexual harassment um, on college campuses. It was deemed to be a form of sex discrimination. Uh, then over time, um, it became, uh, judges started to find that um, sexual assault, including the most serious forms of it, uh, like rape, uh, were actually for Title IX purposes, to be considered a form of sexual harassment. Uh, therefore, sort of putting uh, all sexual misconduct, which is sort of an umbrella um, act. Um, there really is, un, I think, unfortunately, in my opinion, um, a, a it's considered to be put on a spectrum from forcible rape on one side to uh, people telling dirty jokes um, on the other side. And those are actually the rape is, is sort of for these purposes considered to just be a really, really severe version um, of the of sexual harassment. Um, so that's why uh, universities uh, can't simply hand it over to the police. And that's that's probably the biggest uh, question and actually that we get and actually uh, the biggest place where people who generally care about civil liberties are skeptical about why we bother to do anything in this area, because they say, look, this is this is dumb. Why is fire uh, care about this? This should just be a job for the police. Um, you know, that, however, uh, if that were to be, uh, become the case, I think it would take, uh, Congress to, to change the law. And I don't foresee that happening anytime soon. Sam. So because oftentimes these cases involved allegations of criminal conduct, the accusers can also bring their cases to the police. So there could be parallel cases going on, one in a campus disciplinary process and one in a court of law. But what happens in a campus disciplinary process or what is said in a campus disciplinary process uh, by the accused can be admissible in a court of law. So does that not create a problem just from a fairness perspective because you are not given the same rights that in a campus proceeding as you would in a criminal proceeding? Well, it absolutely does, you know, and it really highlights a lot of the problems that these new regulations um, look to fix because you have situation on campus now where students are routinely called in um, for meetings with administrators to answer questions about alleged misconduct 
with notice that might just look something like, you know, you've been accused of, of conduct that violates the university's policy on sexual misconduct. Um, you know, please come meet with the dean on, you know, May 1st, whatever. And the student may have to actually show up and start answering questions um, without, you know, having any idea what they are alleged to have done wrong. Um, and, and many of these students don't know, schools often don't, uh, even though under uh, the Violence Against Women Act, as I mentioned, uh, students are entitled to have an advisor with them at every stage of the proceedings. Schools often don't offer up this information to students. So very often students will go into these meetings alone with very little idea of what to expect without understanding that something that they say uh, in that case may be used later in a criminal proceeding. Um, now, you know, interestingly, not as many of these cases as you think um, do involve parallel criminal uh, proceedings. And that's because typically, uh, you know, the way that consent and sexual misconduct is defined on college campuses is very different from the way it's defined at law. Um, so, you know, there's not there's not as much overlap as you might think, but it is a, a very valid concern. And it's, it sort of underscores why students need a fair procedure uh, in these cases. Can you dive into a little bit of the, you know, how colleges define consent and how maybe the law or the general population defines consent? Because as you said, there there is a bit of a divergence there. Yeah. So colleges increasingly use what we call an affirmative consent standard, which instead of if you think of traditional consent as no means no, be, meaning that, you know, sex is sort of presumptively consensual unless there is evidence that there wasn't consent. And that evidence might be evidence of force. It might be evidence of coercion. It might be evidence of incapacitation. But, you know, you start from the presumption that sex was consensual, and then, you know, there needs to be evidence that it wasn't. Under the affirmative consent or yes means yes standard, the, the presumption is that the sex was not consensual unless there is evidence um, of affirmative consent to um, the sexual encounter. And not just the sexual encounter. You know, what's interesting is that colleges really atomize um, sex and consent on campus. So, you know, you have to be able to demonstrate that you received consent at every stage of a sexual encounter. Did you have consent to kiss the person? Did you have consent to take the next step? And so on and so forth. Um, and in this sort of judicial setting of a campus judicial process, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, for a student to prove that they had affirmative consent to each and every step of a sexual encounter. Um, because obviously, typically, there are not witnesses or other evidence. Um, so where you set up the situation where the, the presumption is that sex is non-consensual, unless there's evidence that it was, um, it's really a recipe for disaster, particularly when combined with all of the procedural unfairnesses that plague campus disciplinary proceedings. So to be clear, I grew up watching rom-coms with my girlfriends. Just kissing the girl is not consent anymore. So, you know, if Harry meets Sally and Harry kisses Sally, but Sally doesn't give permission to Harry to kiss her first, that would technically, under the definitions many of these colleges use, be unconsensual. Correct. I mean, this is how it goes in a campus disciplinary proceeding. You know, if you are, if the, if the judicial body is evaluating a sexual encounter that involved everything from kissing to sexual intercourse and all the things that might happen in between, they will ask at each step, okay, so, you know, if the statement is first, well, you know, I kissed her. Okay, well, how did you know that you had her affirmative consent to kiss her? Okay, well, how did you know that you had her affirmative consent to put your hand on her thigh? And so on and so forth. And if the student can't come up with convincing answers to each and every one of those questions, uh, he or she is in trouble. And they use... A lot of hay in 2011 was made over the preponderance of the evidence standard, the standard by which colleges would use to judge or determine uh, guilt in these proceedings. And FIRE was among those who made hay out of uh, the requirement that they use this this lower standard. Now, that's the standard, though, Sam, that is often used in, in a lot of civil cases, is it not? So what's the problem with using it here on college campuses? Um, it is often used in civil cases. I think there, there's two real problems that I would identify with using it on campus. The first is that uh, civil litigants have a lot of procedural protections that students on campus are not uh, afforded. So, you know, the, the preponderance of the evidence standard, we say it's 50% plus a feather, right? So it's really just if there's any evidence that it's more likely than not that something happened, then the person is found responsible. 
Um, and when you have protections in civil court, you know, rules of evidence, um, you know, witnesses testifying under oath, uh, things like that, those sort of mitigate the, the limitations of that standard of evidence. You know, in a in a campus proceeding where oftentimes there's not even a hearing, oftentimes you just have an investigator interviewing the parties, uh, possibly interviewing witnesses, you know, at their discretion, and then, re, you know, deciding who's more likely to be responsible, um, that standard of evidence really doesn't hold up. The other thing is that I think that, you know, people compare these campus proceedings to civil proceedings because they can't, you know, they can't throw you in jail for being found responsible on campus in a campus proceeding. Um, but there really is a quasi-criminal element here. I mean, students who are found responsible for sexual misconduct, uh, you know, this is something that affects the rest of their lives in the sense that it's very difficult to get into another school. It's going to haunt them when they try to get jobs. And to be clear, if they're responsible for sexual misconduct, that's entirely appropriate. Sexual misconduct is a terrible crime. The problem is that you have these campus tribunals that really are not primarily aimed at finding the truth and that, you know, the findings of which are really unreliable. So to have students' whole future staked on these really haphazard kind of kangaroo courts is, you know, it's really distressing. Robert, why is cross-examination so important in these sorts of cases in particular? Well, cross-examination, uh, you know, famously, the Supreme Court uh, once called it the, the greatest engine for the discovery of truth. And that's because uh, it really is uh, kind of the engine that makes the adversarial uh, process that we have um, as our American justice system work. Um, you, What it does is it matches up the incentives um, correctly so that the people with the most incentive uh, to uh, defend themselves or, uh, you know, or, or conversely to, um, you know, make sure that uh, their story uh, is believed uh, are the ones who are asking the questions um, and the ones who are driving that. Um, so, you know, there, there's a couple of there's a couple of other aspects um, to it, but it, it's important that you be able um, to, in a live way, be able to face your accuser. I mean, part of it is is just a necessary part of being able to face your accuser, uh, whether that accuser be, uh, you know, in a campus sexual misconduct case, whether that be the person you are accused of having uh, engaged in that misconduct with, or, uh, you know, a witness who's saying they saw you do it or something along those lines. You need to be able to say, okay, well, you know, how can you prove you're there? You were there, et cetera. I mean, even really very basic uh, questions like that, which may not, and I think frequently do not, uh, occur to a a, a a single investigator um, who often has an agenda. They're, after all, paid by the school. Um, they're not paid by the school to never find a problem. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a broken incentive chain there. Um, it's important that the person with the most to lose be the person who uh, is able to ask those questions. Sam, I know you had some other thoughts on this too. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing with cross-examination is that particularly, so these cases almost always turn on credibility um, because there are very rarely witnesses to a sexual encounter. And so typically there's not going to be a lot of evidence of what happened other than one party's word against the others. And in those cases, it's critical to be able to test the credibility of the parties. And there really just is no effective way to test the credibility. If all you have is the two parties' narratives on paper, and all you can do is look at them and say, well, that one sounds a little bit more plausible than this one, that's very different from a situation where the parties are able to listen to one, review one another's statements, listen to one another's testimony. And then pose questions. And again, I'm talking about these questions being posed through a third party, through an advisor, but then pose questions aimed at, you know, to the extent the other person is not credible at showing that the other person is less credible. You really just can't get that from the party's written statements. I mean, having done, having been part of proceedings in which it's all done on the written statements and having done proceedings where you have the ability to ask those questions. There is just no comparison in terms of your ability when you know that that your client is the person who's being truthful. There's just there's no question that it's it's very very difficult to prove that without being able to, to pose questions to the other party that demonstrate uh, whether or not they're credible. So let's talk a little bit about what these May sixth uh, 
regulations do? What are the rights that they give to students who are involved in these hearings? Uh, the regulations provide for an express presumption of inno innocence, which bizarrely was absent from a lot of these proceedings. Uh, they, they allow for live hearings with cross-examination conducted by an advisor of the individual's choice. It may be an attorney. Uh, the regulations require sufficient time and information, including access to evidence, to prepare for interviews and for the hearing. They require impartial investigators and decision makers, and they require that all relevant evidence received in a, a, an objective evaluation. Sam, that was often something that was excluded from these these hearings as well, is that uh, inculpatory or exculpatory evidence just wasn't introduced or given to both parties, Correct. Correct. And if you look at a lot of the lawsuits that have been brought by students who allege they were denied due process, the exclusion of exculpatory evidence is a common theme. Um, and sometimes that evidence is in the sole possession of the university. For example, there was a case at Ohio State University where the university had evidence that uh, the accuser brought a claim after learning that she had uh, you know, failed courses and was at risk of being of flunking out of medical school. And, you know, through the the allegation, she was able to get accommodations um, that allowed her to stay in school. And, you know, the, the accuser did not know this. The school knew this and the accuser did not know this. And the court actually held that, you know, the fact that the school had this information in their possession and did not share it with the student may have violated his due process rights. So now by requiring that schools allow the parties to review all of the evidence in the school's possession, even if it's not the evidence that the school ultimately relies on um, to make its determination, uh, it's going to be a lot harder for schools to exclude exculpatory evidence like that or inculpatory evidence, I should say. You know, I mean, obviously at FIRE um, and, and in my work as a campus disciplinary lawyer, we hear from students largely who allege that they've been wrongly accused. But all of these procedural protections are really important for complainants, too. There are cases where, you know, particularly if the accused student is a high profile athlete or the child of a big donor, uh, the school may have an incentive, a financial incentive to sweep things under the rug. So this is not just that the accused student's going to get to see the evidence, the complainant's going to get to see it, too. So if there's evidence tending to prove someone's guilt that the university is for any reason, you know, inclined to hold back, they're not going to be able to do that either. Robert. Now, another important element of these regulations is the standard that it, they provide for sexual harassment on campus. This is the standard proffered by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1999 in a case called Davis v. Monroe County Board of Education. Can you tell us a little bit about that standard and why that standard in particular is important to avoid the sort of censorship that FIRE has seen throughout its history uh, on college campuses? Yeah. In, uh, in 1999, in that case that had to do with sexual harassment, actually in an elementary school, uh, the Supreme Court went through a lot of the, the same kind of First Amendment analysis that uh, FIRE or any other First Amendment lawyer might go through uh, to try to figure out um, how best to reconcile um, the fact that we do have a First Amendment and we have freedom of expression um, in this country that that needs and must be respected, um, along with the fact that some sexual harassment um, doesn't involve, uh, you know, only physical uh, conduct, but also kinds of conduct uh, that are expression, but maybe not protected expression. Um, so the Supreme Court determined that um, the the conduct at issue would have to be uh, severe, uh, pervasive, and objectively offensive, um, as well as unwelcome. So um, I'll get to, to both of those. And effectively prevent the person from getting an education. And each one of those uh, is important. Um, number one, severe. Um, this is harassment. It's not annoyance. Um, what makes something annoying, what turns it into harassment, uh, a big part of that is the severity of it. Um, if somebody simply uh, tells a single dirty joke and then you never see them again, that's not harassment. Um, it would be it, it cheapens. Uh, often people sort of colloquially talk about that sort of thing as harassment, uh, but it's not. And the courts don't uh, expect schools to treat it like that. Uh, pervasiveness is another aspect that needs to be there. Pervasiveness means that it's something that's hard to avoid, right? That it's that it's all around you or that uh, for some reason you can't just turn it off or walk away uh, or something along those lines. 
Um, and then there is uh, objective offensiveness, which means it needs to be uh, offensive to a reasonable person. If somebody is offended uh, simply by saying, you know, you have nice eyes or something along those lines, um, you know, that's not necessarily going to get over that standard. Um, it also needs to be subjectively offensive to the person, which uh, the way they put that is that it needs to be unwelcome. In other words, if you are saying uh, something that has, is sexual in nature to someone, um, but they are they don't it's not unwelcome to them uh, again that's not harassment because in that case it, it wouldn't even be annoying it would be welcome um, and then finally it needs to have an impact on the person's ability uh, to get an education um, there's been you know a certain amount of argument over for instance uh, if two students uh, get into some sort of conflict um, off campus, you know, or even if they get in conflict, um, you know, with somebody else from a different campus, uh, you know, in, in, a, in an area where, you know, maybe they're home for the summer or they're in another country or who even knows, um, you know, what should the school be able to do? Um, in order to, to limit the jurisdiction of schools so that they don't have literally universal jurisdiction over every single thing a person uh, says or does, uh, it has to actually affect the person's ability uh, to get an education at that school. Um, and the reason that's important is because um, in the 2001 guidance, uh, that, came, that took place after uh, Davis was passed in 1999. But um, instead of simply um, adopting uh, the standard, uh, it's actually an interesting read, not that I would recommend people read it, but uh, to see them try to argue that a watered down standard that said, for instance, severe or pervasive uh, meant the same thing as severe, pervasive and objectively offensive. Uh, they basically said, well, we both mean the same thing. Um, as I think they they put it well in the um, and somewhere in the 2000 pages of the regulations that came out uh, yesterday, um, that hasn't been borne out by reality. Uh, the fact is universities all uh, used much lower standards, uh, pretty much all of them that I know of. I know there are a few exceptions um, that could very easily be abused in many, many cases uh, to uh, censor a lot of uh, constitutionally protected speech. Um, and that uh, did not end up equating to the Davis standard. And, and thankfully, uh, the new regulations say um, not in the name of Title IX, you're not going to do that anymore. We're, we're going to say uh, that for Title IX purposes, uh, this is the definition of sexual harassment. And uh, if you're going to attempt to punish um, expression for some other reason, uh, that's not for this reason. Um, you, you don't have that excuse. So we've heard critics say that this is a a very stringent standard, this severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive standard. But when the Davis case came down, who was it? Kennedy thought it might Kennedy, yeah. not be speech protective enough. Yes, this it was Davis was a five four decision with, uh, and this standard was written by the five liberals of the court. Um, if you count O'Connor as, as as the moderate, I believe she was the one who wrote the opinion, and um, the the four conservatives who Kennedy wrote the uh, dissent there said. Um, I think very presciently <laughs> in many ways, hey, this standard uh, is not uh, stringent enough. It's going to uh, enable a whole lot of uh, censorship on college campuses um, or excuse me, not on college campuses and education generally. Um, you know, at this point, you know, we're now arguing that, um, you know, Davis is uh, the right standard to use. I actually think there are good arguments uh, out there uh, that somebody could entertain that uh, Davis is, you know, insufficiently stringent. I don't think that's a crazy argument. Um, but frankly, um, you know, I think the Davis standard and, and fire has, has long taken the position the Davis standard, um, if properly uh, applied and and there is a lot of uh, rubber meets the road type of stuff there. Um, if properly applied, uh, will protect uh, the right um, expression that is protected, um, and also allow uh, colleges um, to uh, not to protect uh, behavior or expression that's you know so severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive. I'm I'm just repeating myself there, but uh, that it um, does amount to sexual harassment. A lot will depend on. Uh, the sincerity of colleges actually applying that standard, and, and that remains to be seen. So in talking about these regulations, and FIRE since 2011 has been, I hate to say that about, about ourselves, but we've been the lead champion in trying to get these regulations rolled back and to get due process 
and free speech reintroduced uh, to these campuses or introduced in some cases in the first place to these campuses. And in making these arguments, we're having to kind of put on an education for a lot of people as to why certain things are done in America. Like, why is the presumption of innocence a good thing? Why is cross-examination important? Why is it important that we have impartial investigators and decision makers? Why is it important that the judge and the jury be separate? So Sam, I kind of want to do a little bit of a rapid fire with you as we near the end of this podcast to just kind of talk about a couple of those things. Like why is it important that the person who conducts the entire investigation and presumably knows the most about the allegations and the evidence, why is it important that they're not the ones who make the decision about guilt? Why do we separate the police and the prosecutor, for example? Right. Because, you know, there's a there's an opinion in a case from Brandeis University where a judge he puts it so well that I almost I mean, I don't literally have the quote in front of me, but I, I'm going to try to sort of paraphrase him as best I can. He said, basically, any time you combine all of these roles in one person, even if that person is incredibly well intentioned, their own biases and prejudices and preconceptions may infect the process. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a sort of a checks and balances thing, you know, even if that person, I mean, unfortunately, for a lot of other reasons, that person on campus is not always impartial and unbiased. But even if they were, um, it's just it's a lot of authority to put in one person and you want to have those checks and balances in place. I mean, you know, precisely because of the presumption of innocence. It also means you only have to fool one person. Um, I mean, that's important, too. When you've got all of that power in in one hands, um, you know, that those people have one specific set of vulnerabilities, whether it, everybody's got prejudices. It's unreasonable to expect uh, that they don't and, and other things like that. So it really um, puts too much, you know, it, it's it's kind of like putting all your eggs in one basket. Um, if you figure out a way to, to grab the basket, uh, you've uh, hijacked the whole process. And the, the training material, well, so... For clarity, the single investigator model that was popular on college campuses for many years is now banned by the regulations, correct? Yes. It is, but it should be noted that the regulations don't go into effect until August 14th. So there are still, I mean, the single investigator model still dominates on campus right now. Um, And so it's not, you know, it's not yet a thing of the past, though it soon will be. And why did, uh, just kind of a quick aside, why did colleges go to that model? Is it just the most efficient and cheapest way to investigate? Or did they honestly think this was the best way to to handle these serious allegations? I mean, one, one big sort of conflict between the way colleges see their processes and the way uh, you know, people outside of the ivory tower see them is that schools like to like to say that their process is educational, right? And they really shy away from anything that comes across as adversarial. They're very afraid of of sort of operating mini courtrooms. And to to some degree, I don't entirely blame them. I mean, colleges have been forced by Title IX into operating these sort of parallel judicial systems, and I can't imagine it's easy, even when they do have good intentions. Um, so I think a lot of it is just an effort to avoid this sort of adversarial model. Um, but I think, unfortunately, to have a fair proceeding, that adversarial model is genuinely unavoidable. It's also been sort of spoken about favorably by the federal government under the Obama administration. There was a White House task force um, to protect students from sexual assault that issued a report. And that report spoke favorably about the single investigator model, which I think led of a lot of schools uh, to think, OK, well, if, if we do that, um, you know, we're going to be sort of complying with Title IX and with what the federal government wants us to do. Now, another thing that we had seen in a lot of these cases were training materials that were biased. Training materials, so not the individuals actually actually uh, conducting these investigations, but training materials that said that if someone sounds logical, that's an evidence of their guilt. Robert, you had talked a little bit about this in your book, Twisting Title IX. Can you explain for our listeners what those training materials sometimes look like? And do you suspect those training materials will go away now that these new regulations are put in place? Um, well, I certainly hope that uh, the worst ones at least will go away, although I suspect that uh, suddenly a lot of the training will become more in the in the, the manner of lore uh, than actual training. Uh, I hope I'm wrong about that. The, the new regulation your fear that they're just going to stop putting it in writing. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we have, you know, one of the really appalling ones that we did run across, um, 
was using a uh, a book uh, that was written um, dealing with uh, how to deal with domestic violence victims um, and talking about uh, the, the sort of nature that uh, domestic violence victims in the, or excuse me domestic violence perpetrators in the in the opinion of the author uh, had and, and acting persuasive and logical uh, would be one of the signs of guilt um, you know and conversely having a story that you know didn't you know hold together that well or you know wasn't you know didn't necessarily follow um was actually considered to be sort of a sign that that people are telling the truth um there's a lot of inbuilt um sex stereotyping there uh too uh having to do with uh the way uh men and women uh supposedly uh relate um and one thing that we have found which i think is extremely ominous and i've never had a good explanation of this uh is that fire actually um has uh, we requested we foiled uh title nine training materials from many schools we also requested uh title nine uh, training materials from a number of private schools um we got resistance on many of the foias uh, many of them did end up coming through not a single private school which was not subject to a freedom education request was willing to send their training materials to us not a single one there is absolutely no defense for that um and uh, in in many cases throughout this entire process i will say uh that um unfortunately the opponents of due process have been uh relying on um frankly a lot of obfuscation and refusal to engage um in argumentation of any kind um in order to avoid uh, explaining things like why for instance uh you wouldn't say uh students are innocent until proven guilty um you know we, we saw that happen uh twice in a row more than 70 percent of the top 53 schools 72 percent i think uh failed uh to say anywhere in their policies that students were just come out and say hey they're innocent until proven guilty um, we pointed out the first year, second year, there was no difference. That is not an accident. That is done on purpose. And there is, there is simply no justification for it. And yet the schools um, have continued uh, to do their very best uh, to avoid ever having to explain any of this. Sam, double jeopardy. This is something that's core to America's fund, Americans' fundamental understanding of a fair process, the idea that you cannot be tried for the same crime twice. However, on college campuses, you can. So, And th these regulations, unfortunately, do not fix that, but their hand, the, the Department of Education's hands were also a little bit tied. So why, why is it important that, that people not be tried for the same crime? crime twice and how do these regulations address the question of je double jeopardy i mean it's just it's been one of the fundamental principles of our justice system um and yet on campus as you say um both parties have to be given the right to appeal um and if you think about what it's like to go through that process once and to be found not responsible and then essentially um to have to go through it again now the department says that you know you have to be able to appeal on three bases and, you know, they're fairly narrow. Um, they are, I don't have it right in front of me. So Robert, you can jump into, but it's, you know, a new evidence that wasn't available at the time of the hearing. It's, um, I think, substantial procedural error. Um, you know, it's not, it, the department does not mandate that people be able to appeal sort of on a blanket. Uh, you know, the finding wasn't supported by the evidence. Um, but it does unfortunately allow for uh, schools to add additional bases for appeal. And so if schools add the additional basis for appeal that, you know, you can appeal on the grounds that the findings weren't supported by the evidence, that's essentially uh, just a, a rehearing. Um, and it does, it will put students in that, in that position. And, you know, among the, the many lawsuits we've seen um, against schools, we have seen a fair number of cases where students were found not responsible. And then on appeal, they were found responsible sometimes based on, uh, you know, allegations that were not introduced at the original hearing, not because they weren't available or were brand new, but just because they weren't introduced the first time around. Um, and that's terribly unfair. So this is sort of one of the downsides, even of these new regulations, is that the double jeopardy uh, continues. But, uh, you know, overall, this is a huge, I mean, live hearing with cross-examination, unbiased trainings with training materials having to be made publicly available on a school's website, access to all of the evidence, meaningful notice. Um, you know, there are, you know, as, as we just discussed, a few problems with these regulations, but overall, it's an overwhelming improvement. Um, and I think it's going to go a huge way towards restoring 
due process on campus. We've said students a lot, uh, but a lot of the Title IX abuse that we see on campus also occurs with faculty members. Uh, Laura Kipnis was famously uh, brought up on a lengthy Title IX investigation uh, for writing a book about the abuse of Title IX at Northwestern University. There was the case of the professor at Howard University who wrote a law exam question about Brazilian wax who was put through like something like a 500, 500 day investigation because one of his students took offense to the, the legal question. But this, this, these regulations are mostly focused on students, right? I mean, this is focused on peer-on-peer issues? Well, uh, the, yeah, in, in terms of um, what we've been talking about, yes. Um, they, they actually um, do also, I, I think maybe even for the first time, actually explain uh, officially in terms of regulations that um, there's quid pro quo sexual harassment, which is uh, the the sort of traditional thing, uh, you know, sleep with me and you get a promotion or, or vice versa. You don't get a promotion if you don't sleep with me, um, uh, which really um, applies uh, to employees. Um, so that has a lot to do with faculty. But, um, you know, it, it's sort of been assumed that that was part of it anyway. Then we've got um, the the peer uh, hostile peer on peer hostile environment harassment, which is which is governed by Davis um, and part of the reason is that because schools are also an employer, there's a lot of employment law that applies to faculty members. I do think there will be positive knock on effects um, here. I think trying to, for instance, I I think it'd be much harder for Northwestern to justify or get away with um, another Laura Kipnis uh, inquisition um, once these new rules uh, take effect, simply because uh, that was so preposterous. It really can only be supported by a hugely um, overwrought kind of Title IX apparatus. Um, So I think there will be positive knock on effects for faculty, but you're right for the most part um, that uh, these regulations don't have a ton to do uh, with the way faculty members are going to be treated. Right. I mean, I think Robert, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but you know, on a lot of campuses, the way that faculty claims are handled is that the investigation might be done pursuant to a campus Title IX policy, because a lot of times the sexual misconduct policy applies to all um, faculty, students, and staff. But then there will be different sort of ultimate adjudication and sanctioning processes for faculty and staff that are different from the student processes. I would guess that to the extent that investigations into faculty are conducted pursuant to schools' Title IX policies, that those investigations will have to comply with the new regulations. Yeah, that's a good point. In terms of the notice given and things like that, um, I don't know that faculty will be, in, you know, will be granted the hearings and things like that because that's often where you see these policies diverging. Um, you know, you'll have the investigation done under the auspices of the Title IX policy, and then the faculty will have its own sort of adjudication and sanctioning practices. Um, but I do think, I'm, like, and again, I'm not positive, but. I think that to anything that would that's actually occurring pursuant to the university's Title IX policy will now have to comply with the regulations in terms of notice and access to evidence and things like that. What do you? Think? No, that's that's a good point, and you know, and and the reason for the difference is briefly um, has a lot to do with the fact that so many faculty um, have provisions about this in collective bargaining agreements or contract agreements. Um, so you might have right now a school, for instance, that has a single investigator uh, for students who ends up uh, effectively making the decision, but faculty uh, would get a hearing. Um, so, you know, in, in many cases, schools, because faculty have, you know, students really have no bargaining power at all. Faculty do. Um, and so many times they have protections uh, that are different in that way. And that's, and that's why you often see uh, the clear and convincing standard for faculty members that's right. when they're going through the disciplinary process, because that's a part of their collective bargaining agreement uh, with these universities. That's right. So I've got two more questions, one for Sam and then one for Robert before we sign off. Sam, the courts, they've been kind of going in the direction of compelling universities to provide some of these protections that these regulations now guarantee. Correct. Ab- absent the Department of Education coming out with these regulations, what would we have seen schools have to start doing just as a matter of being good by the law as the judges in these various courts have uh, seen it? Well, it would vary a lot depending on where you were in school. So, for example, the Sixth Circuit, which includes uh, Michigan and Kentucky and Ohio um, and uh, 
I don't know if you have any other six circuit states to add there, Robert. I don't have them all. In front of <laughs> no, not off the top of my head. Maybe West Virginia. I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, you have district courts in every state. A lot of states have multiple districts. And then you have circuit courts, which are the appellate courts, and they generally include the district courts of multiple states. This is the federal court system I'm talking about. And then above the appellate courts, you have the Supreme Court. So the Sixth Circuit, which governs a handful of, of Midwestern states, has held that due process does require uh, a live hearing with cross-examination in cases turning on credibility. So already- Tennessee. Tennessee is one of them. Already, we were seeing uh, universities in the Sixth Circuit have to revise their policies to be consistent with that decision. Uh, the First Circuit um, has held that some right of cross-examination is, is necessary, but that maybe a more circumscribed type, you know, only through a third party like a hearing panel. You know, the Eighth Circuit is, is considering a case on cross-examination right now. So we've seen this, this sort of case law evolving patchwork around the country such that, uh, you know, students' rights really vary depending on uh, where they were in school. Um, whereas now with these regulations, you're going to have, and of course, very dramatically depending on whether they were in a public or a private school, because constitutional right to due process is something that applies at public universities, but not private. So, uh, you know, now you're going to see this standardized so that the students around the country are going to be entitled to the same rights. Robert, uh, what does this really mean for FIRE? I mean, this uh, a lot of the stuff that's in these regulations have been s things that we've been arguing for, maybe some of our top priorities over the last 10 years. So when yesterday happened, you know, and you're reflecting on everything since 2011, what did it mean to you? What did it mean to the organization? Well, it's obviously a big victory. Um, when, we, when we began uh, this, I believe our first letter to uh, the Department of Education about this was in May of uh, 2011, uh, starting to take issue with this. Uh, frankly, it, it seemed like a, uh, an uphill battle, you know, again, up a cliff. Um, as time uh, went on, um, you know, I, I think that uh, we, we obviously gained allies. Uh, more and more people started to actually uh, noodle through uh, what the problem was. Um, people on both sides of the aisle um, and libertarians as well, um, you know, started to say, hey, there is really a severe problem going on on these campuses. Um, and so I, I think the smart money back in 2011 probably would have been that we were not going to get to uh, this point. Um, so it, it's a huge deal in that sense. But we still have a lot of work to do. Um, the uh, there's already groups that have uh, basically said that they are going to sue to try to uh, stop uh, these regulations uh, from being put in place. Um, unfortunately, uh, Vice President Biden has also said that if he's elected, um, he would undo uh, these regulations. Um, uh, so there's there's fights ahead of us. And then even if, uh, you know, everything is smooth sailing and everybody just decides, hey, you know what, these regulations, we're just going to let it go. Let's 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 do it. Um, I think there's going to be uh, many years of trying to get schools both to implement these regulations properly and or to implement them at all, uh, basically, and then also to actually take them seriously, uh, just in just in the way that fire often has cases at schools whose um you know, where they, uh, you know, obviously most schools have speech codes, but often we have free speech cases at schools that really don't have very much to do uh, with the speech code. Um, they, they find a different way to violate uh, these same rights. I think uh, we'll continue to, to see that. So um, it's a big deal. It's a huge, huge deal uh, once they go into effect for, for students on college campuses for fire. Um, it's sort of another uh, step on the ladder to what we've all hoped from the very beginning, which is uh, basically putting ourselves out of business. And uh, I would love to see that, uh, you know, come closer and closer to happening. Well, for any of our listeners that want to kind of learn more about our work on this issue, you can go to our website. I mean, we've probably written tens of thousands of words over the last nine years about this issue. Robert's written a book <laughs> about this issue. Sam has uh, on our website a due process litigation tracker where she digests a lot of the major cases that have opinions uh, and kind of tells people what the law is or, or what happened in those cases. And that's a, a tremendous resource for anyone who is, is looking to understand that. You know, over the years, FIRE has testified in Congress. We've had meetings with different departments and agencies, different allies. Uh, we've even filed a lawsuit uh, against the administration, uh, the Department of Education, for violating the Administrative Procedure Act. 
that was subsequently uh, withdrawn once the the Dear Colleague letter was rescinded back in 2017. Uh, but we've been at the forefront of this and we've been gathering allies ever since 2011. So it's a huge victory. And uh, I think I, I'm safe to, on behalf of FIRE, thank all of our supporters who might be listening today for, for their continued support throughout the fight. But the fight is not over. We've still got much more work to do to ensure that these uh, guarantees from these regulations are actually implemented on college and university campuses starting August 14th. And uh, I know that my colleagues, Robert and Sam, will be doing everything they can to do so. So Robert, Sam, uh, thanks again for coming back on the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, Robert is the executive director at FIRE, and he's the author of the book, Twisting Title IX, which can be bought at Amazon or wherever else you buy your books. And uh, Samantha Harris is a senior fellow here at FIRE and attorney in the Title IX and campus discipline practice at the law firm Mudrick and Zucker. This podcast is hosted and produced and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. You can learn more about So To Speak by following us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk or by liking us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. We also take email feedback at so to speak at the fire.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever else you get your podcasts. They do help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, thanks again for listening. <laughs>